Okay, guys, let's go. Page 65. We're back in Mitzrayim, Egypt. We're going to look at a very famous metaphor that is used to describe the Egypt experience. It's going to be a three-phase plan. Basically, we, the Jewish people, were created in Mitzrayim, taken out of Mitzrayim, taken to Har Sinai, and then eventually to Eretz Yisrael. The metaphor that is used for this Geula and for the final Geula of Mashiach parallel each other. I'll say that again. We're going to see, my friends, today that there is a metaphor that is used of childbirth. Of childbirth to describe Yitziat Mitzrayim. Okay. What is this metaphor all about? Why do the rabbis use this metaphor? What is it about Leda, birth, that seems to signify the existence in Mitzrayim and then the taking out of, by Hashem, of the Jewish people from Mitzrayim? And it's called Leda, like birth. Hashem, as it were, gave birth to us. Let's have a look. We're going to look at a three-phase pattern. It's going to follow three-phase pattern. Phase one is when we are in Egypt, and that is the Galut. Galut Mitzrayim. Galut Mitzrayim is basically like a fetus in the womb. That's phase one. Hashem. Hashem himself, Kivyachol, not an angel. We said already in the Haggadah, Anivolo Malach, says Hashem, I came, not an angel. Anivolo Saraf, me not a fiery angel, whatever that is. Anivolo Shaliach, Hashem himself went in, Bekerev, inside Goy, to that nation, and took out Goy, Bekerev Goy, a nation from another nation. Just like the doctor pulls the baby, boop, out of the mother, so to Hashem, Kivyachol, went into Mitzrayim himself, biyad Zeroah, with an outstretched arm, and took us out of Mitzrayim. So phase two is the birth. So the next is Yitziat, is the birth from Mitzrayim, from the womb. That's phase two. That's the Yitziah. That's the coming out of Egypt. So what's the third part? The third part, the third phase of phase one, phase two, phase three is from the Exodus, from Mitzrayim to Har Sinai. So we're going from Mitzrayim to Har Sinai. And that is pretty much the maturation, right? We're going from Egypt to Sinai. Which we already mentioned, that actually is a 50-day period. It's a 50-day period. Actually, it's 49 days, and the Harsina is actually on the 50th. So we have the fetus in the womb, we have the birth, and then we have the journey from Mitzrayim right through to Harsina. Let's have a look at that inside, so you know what I'm talking about. It says that Galut Mitzrayim, Nimshala, is compared Limeha Ibur like a woman who is pregnant. And by the way, why this particular me metaphor? They could have used many metaphors for change and creation of a nation. Why this particular metaphor? Was it about birth? And why, by the way, do the rabbis use the same metaphor to describe Yomot HaMashiach, Mashiach's arrival as well? Because, and by the way, when it comes to Mitzrayim, do you know the expression is used for galut, for geula of, of Mashiach? Chevle HaMashiach. Chevle HaMashiach is the expression, which translates into, well, when I was a kid, they called it the birth pangs. But I guess the modern interpretation would be the labor. The labor. The labor pains. Chevle HaMashiach. The labor pains of Mashiach's arrival. What does that mean, the labor pains? Well, a woman gets pregnant, and then the fetus starts to grow, and it gets 
more painful and more difficult and more challenging. And then the contractions begin. And then labor begins. And then you go from the most challenging, difficult experience to the most joyous moment, which is the baby's born. That change, say the rabbis, is the perfect metaphor to understand coming out of Egypt, where things got worse and worse and worse until Hashem turned it around, and Mashiach's arrival, when things are going to get worse and worse physically and spiritually until you get to a breaking point. And then, as we said with Purim, it all turns around. It turns around in a moment, and you go from a failure, la'ora, in an instant. It's one of the few experiences where you go from almost sure death to absolute life in just a moment. And the two could not be more different. Right? The baby is inside the womb, inside the amniotic fluid, is living in liquid, and the baby's like, I'm never getting out of here. Right? And the mother thinks the baby's never coming out. They always do, Baruch Hashem. And then it all turns around. Then everything flips around Van Hafechu, and then we have absolute Geula. Okay? That is the way it always goes. So Hashem Himself created the Jewish people. Every other nation was created, say the rabbis, by their own nation states. They create laws. They have to create a whole life. Not the Jewish. The Jewish people were created by Hashem via this process, via this birthing process, just like Mashiach will as well. Look at page 66. You can see the pasuk that the rabbis used to help us understand this. And it says in Devarim, when it comes to Yetziat Mitzrayim, Ohanisa Lokim Lavol Kachat Loi Goy Mikerev Goy. Hashem took a nation out from another nation. That's the metaphor of the womb. Hashem went in and took one person out of another person. He took one nation out of another nation. And that's why it happened very suddenly. Very suddenly, Hashem says, Fight! It's time to go. And we'll see how Matzah is going to represent the sudden movement of the Jewish people from Mitzrayim, outside Mitzrayim. We didn't run out, by the way. When did actually the Jewish people really go free? No. We actually went free while we were in Mitzrayim, when Paro, when you were kids, remember this whole story? Paro in pajamas in the middle of the night. Right? Remember that? Paro's walking around at midnight, because all the firstborn kids are dying, and he's like, get out! He's kicking us all out. That's why the kids always sing, Paro in pajamas in the middle of the night. Paro in pajamas. No, no story as a kid, you never did that? Okay, whatever. So that's the way we were taken out. When did we actually leave? The next day. Right? We're like, we'll go when we're ready. And we have the Korban Pesach, and we had a meal. It took time to cook that. We'll see about the Korban Pesach a little bit more. And we ate it. Beshalva, Beshekah. And then Hashem says, now it's time to go. Be'etzem hayom, a few things happen in the middle of the day. Etzem hayom means the main part of the day. That's when the sun is at its apex, or the highest point in the sky, and everyone's there. So we weren't hiding, we weren't like running out in the middle of the night. We were free to leave the night before, but we left in the middle of the day. Be'etzem hayom, a few things happened. Etzem hayom in the Torah. For example, Noah entered the ark. Be'etzem hayom in the middle of the day. So no one should think we're like sneaking out of here. Right? That means in broad daylight, we would say in English. So we left, right, the next day, broad daylight. But once Hashem said, go, so when Paro said go, we didn't go. When Hashem said it's time to go, we ran. That's when we got going. Okay? And that's why we, the bread didn't have time to bake. Once Hashem said go, we went out of there. Okay? So just like he says, a doctor pulls the fetus out of the womb, or the midwife, so to Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim. But this metaphor goes even more. That's why the man that we lived on for this period over here is called the lavan, the white stuff. Just like a mother gives milk to the child, right, during its formative time, so too Hashem, as it were, kept us going with the lavan, because milk is white. But the man, the man was called the white stuff, the white stuff for the same reason. So this metaphor just keeps going on and on and on, right? It's all about that. Okay? So we have 49 days. By the way, what does the number 49 represent? 
What does number 49 represent? That it represents this, this change for one day. But why? Ah, oh, even better. Why is it called Shavuot? Why is it called Shavuot? It should be called Torah. Torah, right. Shavuot means weeks. It refers to these weeks that lead us. So in other words, the destination of our Sinai is important, but it's the build-up to it. That's why Shavuot is called Shavuot. Weeks. What weeks is it referring to? The weeks that lead up to that time, because it's the preparation period, is the Omer. Why? We're going to get to the Omer after Pesach, Bezrat Hashem. Mm -hmm. so, what, ah, so we don't know yet. What does 49 represent? <laughs> Entire year. No, that was 40. That's the water fell for 40. That's 40. And 40 represents something as well. That's not this. So 49 represents 7 times 7. Right? Equals 49, right? So 7 represents the, uh, the natural world. Right? There are 7 days of the week, 7 colors of the rainbow, 7 notes and musical scale. So 7 represents Olam Hazer. 8 that we'll discuss next semester, because that's when Hanukkah is studied, is Olam Haba. So A represents Lamala Minateva. So this is seven times seven. Eight always represents that which is above the physical world, the spiritual world, the metaphysical world. Seven always So it's seven times seven. By the way, there's another time we follow seven, then eighth. What's that? Seven that goes into eight is Sukkot into Shemini Atzeret that we'll do next semester as well. You go from seven days of Sukkot and the eighth day Shemini is Shemini Atzeret. This is a double version of that. It's seven times seven and then the fiftieth is the one after. That's like Shemini Atzeret. So Shavuot is compared to Shemini Atzeret. Okay, don't need to know that song. It's just interesting. That that's, that, that, and that happens six months apart. So that is, the, that is the journey. It's seven times seven. So seven represents Olam Hazer. So it's seven times seven. We're working on ourselves until we get to the 50th because the Torah was not given to the 49th. It was given 49 plus one, which is the 50th. Do we count the 50th day of the Omer? No. We count 49. And the 50th is Shavuot. You don't count it. When we get to Shavuot, which we'll do after, after Omer, we'll see why you cannot count the 50th. It's not countable. The giving the Torah is beyond time and space and number. All right? Is the other seven the other world? No. Seven? Oh, there are seven uh, heavens, that is true. But it usually represents this world. All right? There's always one, two, three, five, six. The natural <coughs> rhythm of Olam Hazer is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, then back to one again. That's days of the week. Right? The news is killed. Da, 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 and then back to one again. There's no eighth, although Mashiach comes, there will be an eighth note. There will be an eighth octave, they say, whatever that means. Okay, some other... Uh... Okay, so this is all spiritual preparation. So that's the journey. That's this part over here, which we'll discuss when we talk about the Omer, because the Omer is going to be this piece over here. These 49 days is the Omer. We'll see why that is, what they would do during that time, what we do at this time. But right now, so we've done the fetus in the womb. And now we've done the birth from the fetus, from, from the womb itself. That's the birth itself. Good. And all of this was a Baruch Hu coming to redeem the Jewish people in order to create us as a nation. Okay. Let's have a look on page 68 at a very famous Ramban, Rav Moshe ben Nachman. And he says, and I brought it down the English so it's easy to read, but he says something fascinating. The Ramban says, you know, by the way, we'll see that the number that represents Pesach is going to be two main numbers. A few, actually. The number three, we're going to see three matzot, right? Three phases of the Exodus. Then it's going to be four. Four is going to be, so there's four cups of wine. And then we'll talk about a fifth cup of wine as well, Bezrat Hashem. That's four. Four questions of the Pesach Seder. So we've got three to four. And then we'll see the key number, which you don't see, as far as I know, anywhere else, is the number 15. There's going to be 15 parts to the Seder. So we'll talk about that number later on. So this number three is very important. Okay? Because, says the Ramban, basically, up to this point in history, look inside, look on page 68. 
He says, from the time the world was created until the Yetzirah Mitzrayim, everybody was involved in Avodah Zara, in idol worship. And that came in three forms. Number one, some people denied God's existence altogether. Some people acknowledged God's existence, but denied that he has knowledge of the events in this world. And some people admit to his knowledge, but they didn't believe that he's involved in this world. So those are the three, which actually still exist, three ways of thinking. One, some people say there's no God. Some people say, no, there is a God, but he's not aware of what happens in this world. He's just not involved. He created and then he steps back. He doesn't. And the third version is some people said, no, he created the world. He's aware of what's happening in it, but he's not involved in it. He's not involved. There's no hashgacha. Those are the three ways of thinking. Can you see that? Highlight those three ideas. That's the way the world existed. And we're seeing a parallel over here, the existence of the world before Mashiach comes. Right? It's going to be these three things. Some people, there is no God. Some people, there is a God, but he's not aware. Somebody, he is, he, there is a God, he is aware, but he's not involved. Yitzhi Misraim upturned those three. Upturned them. When Hashem took us out, number one, we know there's a God that creates the world, because he was on full show. Number two, he has knowledge of what's happening in this world, because he was involved in the whole Egypt Exodus experience. And finally, and this is the most important, we have the idea of hashgacha. That is the main lesson. Hashgacha. What does hashgacha mean? That Hashem is involved. He's the mashkiach. He's a, just like you have a mashkiach who washes over the kitchen, right? Because he's the supervisor. Hashem supervises. That is the word that means that God is intim intimately, not just creates the world, not aware but is actively involved. How do you show a world that there's a God who's involved in the world? He gets involved using miracles and saves the Jewish people. That is why this event is so big for not just us, but the entire world. Hashem takes us out. The whole exodus from Egypt wasn't just to free a people. It's to demonstrate Hashem's koyach, His power in this world. Yeah, Maya. Yeah. Like, we're talking now. Because I feel like that these are all the signs of, like, it's sad to say, but, like, I know, I know Jewish people that each one, one, two, and three, they all... Sure. So is this sure. a way of... The Rambam says before Mashiach comes, we're going to see a wave of atheism spread through the world. It's going to include Jews, unfortunately. You see them all the time. All those celebrities, right? And we just talked a couple of nights ago. That, you know, the Oscar guy gets up there and says, I am un-Jewish. He makes his money off the Holocaust. He's good at that, right? But uh, he'll, he'll do that. Yeah, this is... This is uh, we know there's going to be a wave of atheism, he says, based upon... Rambam says this, based on a prophecy from the prophet Daniel, that we're going to see only pockets of truth around the world. Many Jews, actually Jews, ironically, have the, as, a, as a religion, as an affiliation, have the highest incidence of atheism, which makes sense, actually. Because if you're a believing Christian, what do you do? You know, you believe in Jesus and that's pretty much it. You know what I'm saying? Well, right? Or a Muslim, yeah, yeah, I believe it. Right? But as Jews, it comes with a whole, uh, a whole package of Torah, mitzvot, and responsibilities. So I kind of get it. You know what I'm saying? If anyone's going to... Um... Okay. So, so yeah. To prepare, like, are we supposed... Like, is he really involved in this world right now? That's the whole point. Absolutely. We're learning from the Pesach story. Right? This is the model that Akash Baruch Hu created the world, no, as knowledge was happening in the world, and is involved in the world. Those are the three main things that were not known. I'll give you an example of this. You know, there's a midrash. I didn't bring it down. I should. It's a great midrash. That when Moshe Rabbeinu first went to see Paro, Moshe Rabbeinu said, I'm here to represent the God of Israel. The Yud with the He and the Vav and the He. And what did Paro do? Anybody know what he did? He said, bring me my book of God. So one of his kids or servants, I can't remember who it was, brings him a thick book of thousands of gods they had in Egypt. There are tons of them. And he looks at her and says, he's not here. And he closes the book. 
kind of midrash is that? What does that even mean? So why didn't he just take out a pen and say, fine, there were 10,000 gods. Now there's 10,001. Why don't you just like, okay, fine, you have your god, we have enough of them. Just add it to the list. So the answer is, this is very carefully. The answer is, because the idea of the Jewish god that Moshe Rabbeinu introduced into Mitzrayim at that time, that was known beforehand, right, through our avot, was a completely different idea. That God is the God of love. All the gods in Egypt, people used to fear. Right? They needed the rain, so they had the rain god. They needed the Nile, the, the god of the Nile. They needed the fish, there was the fish god. And that god. They needed the sun, there was the sun god. They always feared and they used to sacrifice, literally, their children to appease God. What was introduced over here was a new concept that didn't fit into their godly vision up to that point, which is that God loves us. I'm going to prove it by saving people and being actively personally involved. That's the idea of the God of love, which did not exist up to this point. I mean, in the knowledge of Egypt anyway. That was the, the new thing. Okay? So there was a whole new concept of belief that existed at this time. That's what the Ramban says. Very famous Ramban. They make most yeshiva boys memorize that Ramban. It's a very important one. Moshe introduced a new concept of God that, well, not a new concept of God because it was known to the Avot, but he publicized and brought it to the world <coughs> via this whole Egypt experience, the idea that there is a God who exists, who has knowledge of the world, and who is involved in the world. And he does that through love, through Ahava. It's all through love, not through fear. That was the big revelation at this time, among other things. What is all of this, which we've said so far? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when they got to Har Sinai, very, very good, yeah, yeah. There was a, it was a fear experience. We're going to see when we get to Shavuot. And it wasn't the Purim story, they fully accepted it with love. That was the Kabbalah of the Torah. This is the creation of the Jewish people. And then we have Kabbalah Torah, which came with a tremendous amount of responsibility and fear. When we get to Shavuot, we'll see why. It was a scary thing, God bless you. And then at Purim, they accepted it all with Ahava, with, uh, with love, and not just fear. Okay? What has all this got to do with Chametz? What has Chametz got to do with this whole Pesach story? What is Chametz? Why does Chametz, leavened bread, what is leavened bread? got to do with our experience in Mitzrayim. Why do we, how does that, I mean, we're discussing creation of the Jewish people and miracles and the Korban Pesach. We've discussed a lot of stuff so far. What has all that got to do with chametz, with leavened bread? Why is that so bad? Why is chametz so bad? Is chametz bad right now? No. no? Does anyone use chametz to do any mitzvot right now? Yeah. Such as? Chal on Shabbat, right? Bread on Hamotzi. Berachat Hamazon. We have so many mitzvot. We have Hafrashat Chala. We have many, many mitzvot that relate to Chametz. And yet, once a year, Chametz becomes the worst thing. On Pesach, during this whole story, the background is Chametz. Why is it so bad? What is so bad about Chametz? And why now? Why during Pesach? Why not during Sukkot? I don't know, Shavuot? What's the problem with Chametz? Why does it represent this Egypt experience? That's what we're going to have to figure out. Thoughts? Well, first of all, what is Chametz? Is it wheat? It's unleavened. What does unleavened mean? It's, well, chametz actually is risen. Matzah is the opposite. 
So chametz is going to be the problem. Matzah is going to be the solution. But we're not up to matzah. There's two separate things. There's a mitzvah do'oraita to remove all chametz from your possession. You shouldn't see it. You shouldn't have it. You can't own it. You can't get any benefit from it. It's extreme. And then we have the opposite, which is the mitzvah do'oraita, the Torah mitzvah of eating matzah, which is a separate mitzvah. The two separate things. So you have two things here. Get rid of chametz is one mitzvah on a Doraita level. Eating chametz, by the way, on Pesach is the same as eating food on Yom Kippur. It's karet. It's one of the worst things a person can do. Why? Like two days before, it's a mitzvah. Two days later, the same food that is a mitzvah now becomes one of the worst of us. By the way, it's even worse and more challenging than kashrut. You know, if something non-kosher, listen very carefully, falls into kosher food, it is batel, nullified, ba, shi, shim, one in 60. It's nullified. That's different. That's the Inesach. That's completely different. This is if non-kosher food goes into kosher food and there's 60 parts kosher to one part not kosher, it's okay. It's batel. Chametz is not batel at all. If a little bit of bread on Pesach, not Erev Pesach, on Erev Pesach it works, but on Pesach, a little bit of bread falls into your food, you can't eat it. It's not batel. I feel a bit elf, one in a thousand. This chametz stuff is like toxic waste. It's like nuclear. It's very extreme. Kosher. Batel. Nullified. Chametz. Not nullified at all. Let's look on page 69 at the bottom of the page. Let's learn this Gemara together. Ladies, phones away, please. Let's have a look at a famous Gemara of Rabbi Alexander. By the way, is Alexander a Jewish name, by the way? Alexandra, a Jewish name, Alex? Hi. Hi. I was named after a Jewish princess who used to live in Jordan a while ago. Oh. So, that's you're, you're a Jewish princess, Alex. Every Jewish woman is a Jewish princess. But I was named after one. Very nice. Where does the name Alex come from? Is that a Jewish name? No, it's Greek or something. Roman. Wasn't Alexander the Great? Was Alexander the Great. Who was Alexander the Great? When we discussed Hanukkah, we're going to see. He came during the Greek exile. The Jewish people were in Eretz Yisrael. And he brought tremendous blessing to the Jewish people. He was actually very good to the Jewish people. He was so good that for one year, every Jewish boy that was born was named Alexander. Ever since then, that's become a Jewish name. There's even a Rabbi Alexander in the Gemara. That was a sign of Akar Tov to Alexander the Great. Once he died, and he died very young, People took over from him, we'll see. And his kingdom was split into four, and that's when things got bad. We have the whole Hanukkah Assyrian Greek problem that we'll talk about another time. But there was an Alexander, Rabbi Alexandra, his name. And he would pray. And we're told the special prayer of Rabbi Alexander. Listen to his prayer. And he would say, God, Hachi Amar, God, Ribbon Olamim, Galui Vila it's known before you. It is our will to do your will. What's holding me back from doing what I'm meant to do? What's holding me back from doing mitzvot and doing averot? And he gives a very strange answer. Saor Sheba Isa. It's the dough, the yeast, the or the yeast in the dough. Wow, that's weird. He's like, you know what? You know we want to do the right thing. You know we want to do mitzvah and not do averot. You know what's the problem over here? The yeast, the leavening agent in the dough. What is that? Says Rashi, that is the Yetzahara. The Yetzahara is compared, the Yetzahara is compared to the Saor Sheba Isa, to the leavening agent, i.e. chametz, in the dough that makes the dough chametz. That's the Yetzirah. Wow. Why would that be? Why is this rabbi very famously comparing the Yetzirah to the 
to the yeast, the leavening agent in the dough. But that's what he would say. And then he would say, God, may it be your will. Save us from the eight Sarah. So we can do your will. Look at Rashi on the bottom of page 69. Inside our hearts. Hamach mitzenu, which is chametz. So now we find another layer over here. Chametz is a physical metaphor for the yetzer hara. You know what the chametz represents? The yetzer It's chametz. Unusual metaphor. Even on face value, if you want to remove the eight Sarah from your life, you want to remove the chametz from your life, right? I'm great. Yeah, we're great. Yeah, we're chilling. We're set for life. We're chilling. Page 70. Let's see the Sefer Chinuch. This is a mitzvah mina Torah. Mitzvah number 117. Says the Sefer Chinuch is to remove chametz. What, by the way, what makes matzah turn into chametz? What makes matzah turn into chametz? Or what makes dough turn into chametz and not remain matzah? What's the answer? Time. Zman. Zman. Absolutely. Time. You have 18 minutes from when the flour hits the water and you've got to keep working it and then you get that, you put it inside the oven, it cooks, there is no leavening agent, nothing in there to let it rise, and it stays flat. So time. What else is different between chametz and not chametz, i.e. matzah? It's round. Okay, it is round, but you can make round chametz as well. Yeah? Yeast, Yeast for sure. Time. And what does it do? It inflates. It rises. It rises, right? You, you leave, I don't know if you made challah yet, my wife makes challah, leaves on the counter, it starts low, and then the yeast starts to interact with that bacteria inside there, and whoop, and whoop, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it fills up. It's nice, big, yummy, and fluffy. It's big. It's full of air. It's full of itself. So now chametz represents yetzara, but a very specific aspect of yetzara, which is being full of yourself. Time, sitting there, taking your sweet time, and ego. Ego is the Yetzirah. Yetzirah is compared to Ga'ava. To Ga'ava, to ego. It fills up with itself. It fills up. Matzah, yeah. Matzah is flat, it's a humble thing, it's low. The Yetzara is the ego inside you that inflates, that is full of itself. That's the aspect of who we are. We need to destroy specifically, we'll see why, on Pesach. Look inside what he says. Therefore, getting rid of Chamet symbolizes our desire to work with enthusiasm. You see matzah being made, you're running around quickly, out of the flag, whatever, boom, 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 boom. Right? As the rabbis tell us, mitzvah baliado, when the chance to a mitzvah comes to your hand, al tachmitzena. Don't let your mitzvot become chametz. Actually, the word mitzvot is the same as matzot. Mitzvot matzot. They're the same word, different vowels. You want your mitzvot. To be like matzah, what is that? I act quickly. I get the job done. We are in this world for a short amount of time. We want to get as much done as possible. What is the opposite of that? Chametz just sits there and grows and grows and is full of hot air and the job never gets done. So it's chametz versus matzah. We are the matzah people. Yeah. Yes are not getting the job done precisely. Which is why, we mentioned this already, 
we know that when the angels, those who've taken my introduction to Judaism class remember this idea, when the Malachim came to Avram Avinu, he gave them, what was it called? Ugot. Ugot he gave them. It was Matzah. Ugot Matzot. Why did he give it? Because it was Pesach. Gava is ego. Mitzvah bali ado. When the chance to a mitzvah comes to your hand, al tachimisena. Don't let your mitzvot become chametz. How do your mitzvot become chametz? You don't do them. You just leave them there. Don't let your mitzvot become chametz. So that's why the whole story with Avram Avinu serving his guests during Pesach, he's running around. He understood that this time of year is matzah time, is getting the job done. It was springtime which is why it was very, very hot. It wasn't expected to be that hot. Mitzvah bali ador, al tach mitzena. I'd write that statement down. That's kind of, put it in the final kind of question, that expression. Because inside that is this entire story. So we have to get rid of chametz, ay yitzara, ay the ego, ay not getting the job done, and have to become matzah people. That's why the Jewish people left with matzot on their backs, meaning they were alacrity. They were quick and passionate to get out. Okay? So that's why the Pele Let's look on page 70. I'm bringing down a bunch of sources for you. He says, the idea of destroying, when you destroy the Hamet, you're actually somehow destroying your Yetzara, which is what you want to do. Lava Er et Ruach to get rid of the spiritual impurities. I actually read a, a whole piece on this that Mitzrayim the people in Egypt were experts at making bread. There was a chokhmah to making bread. They were the masters of it. They knew how to do it. So we were actually rejecting the Egyptian ideology. But we have to have bread during the year because, you know, we're human. We can't live all the time just in the world of, you know, be your chametz. We still got to live and do and, you know. So that's what the Sefer look on, look on page 70. So when you're destroying the chametz, you're destroying the etzer. That's what you're meant to think when you destroy the chametz, which you're going to do right before Pesach begins. And the yeast in the flour inflates itself, and that represents gava, gavalev, the, 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 the full gava, the full um, ego that is the person. And the ego, says the Rambam, is the biggest thing that holds us back from connecting to Hashem. People with big egos, they don't need God, right? Or so they think. That's why it says, King Solomon says in Mishlei, every arrogant person is a toever, is a, is a bad thing to Hashem. Hashem likes humility. Okay? So by destroying, that's why before you receive the Torah, you have to be free of the Yetzirah. That's why Pesach comes before Shavuot. That's why the Torah was not given in Mitzrayim. It was given outside of Mitzrayim. Because you've got to get out. You've got to get rid of the chametz before you eat the matzah. It could have been you eat matzah and then you get rid of the chametz. I mean, it sounds weird to you because we don't do that. But it could have been that way. No. First you get rid of the Yetzirah and then you sumerah va'asetov, says King David, David Melech says, Sumerah, get rid of the Ra, get rid of the Chametz, Vasetov, and then you do the good, which is, in this case, Matzah. Okay? Are we cool? But the whole point, so the whole point of removing Chametz is a preparation to receive the Torah. You cannot, a slave cannot be involved in Torah mitzvot. They, they're under somebody else's control. So Hashem had to take us out in order to allow us to receive the Torah. Got it? That's what's happening over here. That's what's happening over here. Let's just talk about one more Hebrew word. Got this all down? Gava, Mitzvah Matzvot, chametz, zman, that's the difference between bread, right? Leaven bread, non leaven is time. It takes time for it to rise. You don't give a chance to rise. And that's all a metaphor for the Yitzhara. 
That's the secret of chametz and why we want to get rid of it. And that's why even a little bit of it is such a big problem. Even a little bit of it is a big, big problem. On Pesach. One final idea which we're going to revisit later, but just write it down now. So Har Sinai, the whole Egypt experience, right? The whole Egypt experience was about Harut al Haluchot. Hashem engraved uh, Torah on the tablets. That's Harut. Okay, now we'll talk about these tablets. This is the Ten Commandments. Hashem engraved Harut al Haluchot. So we'll see over here on page 71 that very famous, they say, you know what? Harut can also be read as Chayrut. What's Chayrut? It's freedom. So the two are related. Chayrut, you go free. And then Harut, you etch the Torah into your heart as they were etched into the tablets. It starts here and then goes here. Chayrut, Harut. That's the, it's not just a play on words. Right? It's not just like, you know, it's one, it's connected to the other. The only point of going free is that you take that freedom, then invest it into a life of meaning. Right? Just because you take someone out of jail doesn't mean they become a good person, has meaning, they're just mean they're not in jail anymore. What's a free person? A free person is just a person who's not, not free. They're not, there's nothing special about them, they should be taken out. That would not be enough. Had it just been freedom, it would have been meaningless. It's only meaningful when you reach the third phase, which takes you into Harut. So Harut becomes Harut. That's what the Mishnah says. Okay, let's look at this on page 71. It's a Mishnah Pirka Avot. Torah says, Haluchot ma'ase alukim. God made the Luchot, He made the tablets. Mechtav with his Harut and Luchot, and He engraved the words into the stones of the tablets. And he says, you know, Al-Tikra-Harut, el Harut. He's like, don't say just Harut, engraved. Say Harut, free. Why would I change the word? It's two completely different things. They're related. Freedom only takes on significance when you receive the Torah, which means basically we have bookends. What started at, at Mitzrayim, right, looped into Har Sinai. There's an ark, right, with 49 days in between. And it's a little bit weird because most Jews celebrate Pesach and most Jews do not celebrate Shavuot. But the two go hand in hand. They're, they're related to each other. That's why we connect them by numbering the days in between. When you put numbers between two events, you're connecting those events, right? Now we're going to see why we count up and not count down, that we have to figure out as well. We're going to count upwards. We're not going to count down. Usually when you look forward to an event, you count down. But we're not going to count down. We're going to count up. We're going to go 1 to 49, not 49 to 1. So we'll see why that is. That's going to be a very inter interesting discussion of why we count up from one to the other. But the two are completely connected. They're bookends. Right? Just like Rosh Hashanah is connected to Yom Kippur, which is then connected to Sukkot. Those are bookends. So too, Pesach and Shavuot are connected. And you really can't have one without the other. I mean, you could. You could go free from jail, but then, you know, you may want to go back to jail. I know it sounds crazy, but many people re-offend to go back to jail. And that's where you see the Jewish people complaining they want to go back to Mitzrayim. Why would they do that? Why would you, why would you want to go back? Because if you don't appreciate what freedom is... Are we not allowed to know? What? Well, uh... That is interesting. No, you're not allowed to live in Mitzrayim. I mean, there have been exceptions to that, three big exceptions in history. Each of them ended up terribly. Like, three major periods where the Jews went back to Egypt, and they all three ended up not good for the Jewish people. You are allowed to visit. You cannot reside in it. I mean, the Rambram brings it down to Halakha while I was living in Egypt. He writes, I know I'm transgressing this particular law. Well, the Jews had to hide, run around in order to protect themselves. He was taken there by his family, but he lived there for a while. He also lived in uh, Spain and Morocco. He was all over the place. Yeah, it wasn't an easy time to be Jewish. Not so easy now either. 
Okay, so those, that's the, the, the play on words. So this play on words of Harut Chirut is basically connecting Mitzrayim. You can't mention Yitzhak Mitzrayim without mentioning That's why in the Haggadah, you'll see one of the themes is Har Sinai. Right? It's all about Torah. What's I got to do with that? It didn't happen yet. Why do I care? Mach Batli. Now the two are connected. You've got to pull these together. And this is the key connection. Freedom, Harut. Which is the word that represents the giving of the Torah. Are we good, friends? So you cannot receive Torah unless you are free as a slave. And we are still slaves to the Yetzirah. So Egypt isn't just a place we mentioned. It's not just a state. It's a state of mind. You've got to get out of Egypt. You've got to free yourself from that mentality. There's an Egypt mentality. There's a galut, an exile mentality. Are we cool? Okay. So let's just recap very quickly. We said a lot today. We said that we were taken out of Mitzrayim by Hashem, formed as a nation that brought upon three things. There's a God. He created the world, is aware of what's happening in it, changes the world on our behalf. He took us out of Mitzrayim. He created just like a baby is born and goes through contractions to pull the baby out. Then we are taken on this journey to Har Sinai, and that is crucial. What do we get rid of during this time? Chametz. Chametz represents the Yetzirah. The Yetzirah is what holds us back, said Rabbi Alexander. Rabbi Alexander said, that is what holding us back. So what do we have to do? Two phases. Get out of Mitzrayim and then receive the Torah. That is the two-phase pattern. Not enough just to get out and you can't receive the Torah while you're still a slave. Because if we were slaves to Paro Mitzrayim, we couldn't have kept the Torah mitzvah. Because slaves don't get to do what they want. Right? They are under somebody else's uh, clock. So, chametz is a problem. We get rid of chametz. So what's the solution? Oh, you mentioned it already. And that's matzah. So now let's look at matzah. Now let's look at matzah. Because matzah is going to be one of the two Torah mitzvot of the Pesach Seder. There's going to be two Torah mitzvot of the Pesach Seder. What are the two mitzvot of the Seder? So first is Matzah that we're going to talk about now. And the second is going to be reading the Haggadah. Sipur. The Sipur. The story of Yetzir Mitzrayim. These are the two Torah mitzvot. We're going, to be, we're going to have about five rabbinic mitzvot. Drinking the wine and leaning. Right? But these two are the two Torah mitzvot. Do'oraitas. Okay? Before Pesach, we had the other Doraita of removing chametz. Chametz is a Doraita as well. Yeah? Got to get rid of the chametz. But now Pesach has begun. We have two Torah mitzvot that we do at the Pesach Seder. One matzah, two Haggadah. We're going to talk about this in a moment, because this is very, very important. Haggadah, Sipur, is to speak, is to talk. Lahagid is to talk, which is where the word Pesach comes from, actually. Oh, it's, you can see it in the word Pesach. Pesach is actually a two words put together. Pe, the mouth. Sach, speaks. Pe, sach, the mouth speaks. You've got to talk it out. So the mitzvah is to talk about it in Mitzrayim. We're going to eat the matzah, which we'll see right now that, why that's so important. And then Pesach, you can also, I mean, Sach, by the way, to speak is with a sin. But, you know, sounds the same. It's all about speaking, right? So Pesach, the mouth speaks. The mouth talks. That's the other mitzvah. So we're going to talk about the second one next class. But for now, let's talk about the matzah. And the Haggadah tells us why we eat matzah. Okay? And it says on page 72, if you want to see inside. Matzah zush anochlem. This matzah that we eat, al shuma. Why are we eating it? It's not so obvious why we're eating matzah. Right? According to the Haggadah. Al shum, because shelo hispik betzekam, the dough did not have enough time, shelavateinu of our forefathers, lahachmitz, to become chametz. Ad, until, until God took us out 
Ugu'ulam and took us out of Mitzrayim. As it says in the Torah, the Afu you're going to have to bake this bread. Asher Hotzi Mitzrayim. Ugot Matzah. There's the word Uga. Uga does not mean cake. It actually means round. It means round. That's modern Hebrew. Torah Hebrew, Ugot, is a code word for matzah. For non, non-leavened bread. In money they call it cookies, but that's not Torah Hebrew. No, but like it makes sense because cookies are little round cookies. Well, you could have a square cookie. Ugia. Ugia. Yeah. So, but I'm saying, Uga and Ugia, but come from... The, to go in circles, that's right. And it comes from this, from matzah. That's why the original matzah were round. You getting it? You getting it? It's coming together. By the way, the original matzot were round and they were thick. The crispy matzot you eat now were not the original matzot. That's because they have a much longer shelf life. Real matzah was more like a pita bread, like a soft doughy pita. Uh, safari, many Sephardim do actually have it. They're not very tasty because you're not allowed to add any salt or any other ingredients. It has to be lechem oni, we're going to see in a second. It's got to be poor man's bread. It cannot have any flavor. Can you put stuff on it? Not to the Pesach Seder. Well, don't you eat karosa? Oh, unless, you, unless it's a mitzvah to dip it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You should enjoy it. Okay, so the code word, the code word in the Torah for matzah is uga. It's uga, right? Or ugot matzot. Ugot matzot means, literally means round, but it's a reference to the uh, matzah that we made and left with. So what do they do? So the Torah tells us, Hashem said, make this bread. Because we're driven out of Egypt. We couldn't wait any longer. They didn't make anything else. So they ran out of Mitzrayim. Once Hashem said to go, we were like, now it's time to go. Move. Don't let the matzot turn to chametz. And they ran out. Why did they run out? They weren't escaping. They were free the night before. They could have left, they could have left as fast or as slow as they wanted. Because Hashem said them to, we were excited to get to Har Sinai, the next phase. So matzah is going to represent mitzvot, matzot mitzvot. Yeah. Chametz, Yetzirah, matzot, Torah. Okay. Which is why at the Pesach Seder we do the same thing. We follow the same pattern. We count. We go from eating matzah at Pesach night and we make our way out until we get to Shavuot. Okay? It's called Leil Shimurim, a night of protection. protects us because we were protected as we left Egypt. Got it? It's called Leil Shimurim. That's what the Torah calls it, a night of protection. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So yeah, isn't that why also like it's a thing Christians would say to your door unlocked? You don't need to lock your door. Yeah. That's what they say. I mean that's not literal, but yeah. Okay. Do you not lock the door at night? Where I live, you don't have to, but there are places where Jews live where they it's highly recommended. I don't know if our mitzvot are able to protect us from where you know the places. No, the idea is Hashem protects us during this time. You don't need to. It's okay. It's not one of the Torah mitzvah. Don't worry. You're from Great Neck. What are you going to get over there? Where, where do you live? Yeah, lock your door. Okay. I, I'd actually, I'd bolt it if I were you. Me, yeah, let's be honest with you. With a double bolt. Otherwise, who knows could turn up? Bukharans could turn up. You're in Queens. You don't want to deal with them. I tell you. you don't want to deal with them. Be thankful they didn't steal your house, love. No. 
Okay, so by eating the matzah, we are testifying that Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim, that we are not controlled by the Yitzhara. The matzah is going to represent all of that. So there's going to be matzah at the beginning of the Pesach Seder, which is going to represent... So we have two matzot eatings, really, if you think about it. You have matzot at the beginning, which is lechem oni, a poor man's... Because we used to eat matzah in Mitzrayim. It's like poor man's food. It's very simple. Poor people, uh, slaves, eat matzah. It's the food of an eved, of a slave. Right? It's cheap, quick to make. The slave is too busy. So at the beginning, it represents servitude and challenge and difficulty. But at the end of the Seder, the matzah is going to represent the freedom from Mitzrayim and um, the goodness of freedom. What's the second one? So the matzah, well, that's going to be at the end, that's going to be the afikomen. That's going to represent, that's going to represent, well, actually, the main eatings are going to represent that later on. The afikomen is going to be the end. Freedom. Freedom. It's also, by the way, we're going to see, it's going to represent olam haba. Is lechem oni, it's like a poor person. We start off as slaves in Mitzrayim, right? So it's going to represent that. And by the end, the same food is going to represent freedom. So it has a double meaning, the matzah. It has a double meaning. Good? Okay. Let's just do one last piece, and then we'll, next class we'll do the four cups of wine slash fifth cup of wine. We'll do that next class. There is a rabbinic mitzvah to eat maror. maror. So what does maror represent? What does maror represent? So maror is going to represent bitterness. That's what it's going to represent. God um, allowed the Mitzrayim to make our lives bitter in Egypt. With very difficulty. So that's a sign of the great challenge and difficulty and the bitterness of our time over there. And the custom is we'll see to eat. Some people will eat very uh, harsh, like a horseradish. Some people will eat uh, lettuce, which the more you eat it, the more bitter it becomes. Right? Roman lettuce becomes more bitter. So too, in Mitzrayim, things started not so bad when we first arrived there, and then it got worse and worse and worse and worse. So the maror is going to represent from not so bad, first bite's okay, and the more you chew it, Right, it starts to secrete certain chemicals and it becomes a little bit more sour, a bit more bitter. So the maror is going to represent that. Okay? They represent the difficulty and the challenge. Did we do the last one, the third one? We did it outside. You can see it inside of yourself, yeah. It's the oh. same idea, yeah. Yeah. The idea that matzah represents freedom. Okay? So what does that represent? That even the suffering that we go through and challenge Maror is going to end up with goodness. That's why the suffering before Mashiach comes, just a metaphor, just like the, um, the uh, woman giving birth was the original metaphor, if you remember, right? She goes through the great pains, and then you go from darkness to light, Right? Ma'afela ora, so too Mitzrayim. We went from darkness of Mitzrayim to the light of the Geula. We went from Chametz to Matzah. We go from Maror to freedom. Okay? That's going to be the trans. They all are metaphors for the transition. Okay? Of difficulty to. So the suffering is part of the redemption. It's not like a separate thing, it's part of it. That's why we're going to eat the Matzah and Maror together. We're kind of showing that the matzah represents freedom, the mor represents bitterness, and we put the Buddha together, the bitterness is part of the freedom. Right? It's, it's a, a segue. It's a connection. We're connecting. We're like, yeah, the bitterness wasn't like, oh, I should made it difficult, and we went free. Okay, we know you're here, Mia. We know you're here. You can stop that now. <laughs> what a production. You know what the Gemara says? You sneeze at the truth. I didn't say anything. I'm saying you sneeze at the truth. 
That's why sneezing during the Amidah is a good thing to do. I have a fear of sneezing. A fear of sneezing? I, I hate sneezing. So. What do you do if you need to sneeze? I mean, I've sneezed before, but it's like... Okay, whatever. Elena, I learn new things about you every day. There's always something going on with you. There's always something going on. Okay, so that's the idea of maror. Maror is the bitterness. And you go for maror and you mix it with the matzah, which represents redemption. Okay, you guys are turned off already. Let's stop there. We'll pick this up next class with the four and five cups of wine.